Thank you so much for attending the webinar uh, titled Production Control and Underground Stope Mapping uh, with the Carlson Board Track 2 and the CALS. Um, th thank you for attending. Um, we're really looking forward to, you know, just showcasing, you know, these specific products. Um, if you haven't heard about it um, and you are new, fairly new to this, I'm pretty sure you're going to find this um, helpful. And also the current users, the guys that's currently struggling with these kind of problems, I really I hope that you're going to find it useful. Guys, just before we start, just some house rules. Um, I'm just going to ask everybody just to make sure that uh, you guys are muted. Um, also, switch off your cameras, please. Um, and then also, we're going to have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentations. If you have any questions, you know, during the course of the, of the, during the presentations, please feel free to make use of the chat box. Just type in your question there, and we will attend to it during the Q&A session. Uh, there will be a recording available. So for all our webinars, if you go onto the Optron website under support, there's a webinar archive. All our recordings are available there. Right, so without further ado, let's jump over to our agenda for today. So we are, I'm going to start off just by introducing my co-presenter, Nuno Fernandez from Carlson. Um, he is basically the, um, you know, our channel manager at Carlson. Um, I'm then going to also, he's going to give us a quick overview on the Carlson laser measurement division. Um, he's then going to jump over to his part of the presentations, focusing on production control using the board track two. I'll then take over focusing on the underground stope mapping with the CALS. Then we're going to jump over to the Q&A session and I'll then uh, end off on the, you know, the social media platforms. Um, if you want to fo follow Optron, um, there's a couple of social media platforms that you can, do, um, you know, where you can follow us, where we're going to share information. So if you haven't uh, joined us um, or, or, or not following us currently, um, that's a good opportunity just to see, you know, where are we currently active in. Okay, so without further ado, um, yeah, my co-presenter, as I've mentioned, is Nuno Fernandez. Um, he's basically the director of sales for um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and also the director of the laser, um, laser measurement division. So, Nuno, um, I'm just going to hand over to you just to basically do a, sh a short introduction. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this session. Um, it's always nice having you, and uh, you've really played a big role in the success of this, uh, of our uh, calls and product portfolio. And, um, I mean, we've got a long-lasting relationship, and um, I'm pretty sure it's just going to become stronger and stronger in the future. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh Hello everyone. Good afternoon. And um, yeah, uh, as Gustav uh, just uh, just mentioned, we've uh, we've been working with Optron for for many years now, and uh, it's been a, been a great a great partnership. And we look always forward to to counting on your services and support in the region. Uh, it's, it's been a very good uh, very very good uh, relationship there. And um, yeah, so today we're bringing to you uh, two products. Uh, some of you might might be aware of the uh, the Carlson. Board track and the call, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, as uh, as Gustav mentioned, I'm um, I'm the sales director for uh, for uh, for LMD and also EMEA. So I I cover parts of Europe and obviously the part that matters here, uh, Africa, and essentially anything to do with the Carlson products for uh, for mining, laser mapping, CAD, data collection. So um, at the moment, I am uh, based in York at uh, in the United Kingdom, where we have the uh, essentially the factory that manufactures the products we're going to be discussing today. Um, and in general, yes, I've been with the company for for 18 years. It's kind of hard to believe, but uh, yeah, it's <laughs> the years add up. <laughs> so um, yeah, Gustav, I don't know if you want to go from there, slide it over. Yeah. Okay, so I'll. Uh, just as a, as a brief introduction, so uh, the products obviously today are they're known under Carlson LMD, but uh, a little bit of history here. We uh, essentially Carlson uh, acquired the 
the Renishaw Division SMD about five years ago, where Renishaw and themselves acquire some of these products from the old MDL. So, so for the some of the, some of you existing users and uh, and uh, and seasoned you know miners using the board track and the cows, uh, you probably saw it for the first time under the name of MDL, and then that passed on to Renishaw, and then recently Carlson acquired that division with the hopes of continue the developing of these products and, and obviously improving on the technology. So Carlson LMD or laser measurement division uh, essentially dedicates itself to, uh, to engineering and R&D. So not just for the division itself, but also for Carlson software, which is the, uh, the parent company. And the products that we, we focus obviously out of LMD are the the cavity automatic laser scanner. Not a lot of people know what the CALS means, but it's a, it's an automatic scanner for cavities. So it's a dedicated system for voids and inaccessible um, stopes and, and openings. We we also develop the, the the void scanner, which is essentially a CMS uh, that you uh, that you load on a uh, on potentially a boom or some sort of extension into the void. We, we also develop products like the Fix One, which is a, a fixed laser scanner with the purpose of uh, automatically measure stockpiles and, uh, and volumes. So it's a production monitoring system to, uh, to automatically run calculations on existing stocks. We obviously focus on the core OEM laser modules. So those are just the, the optical and power components that fire the laser. We have different options there. Uh, for some of you that have been in the blasting business, you might have seen the, uh, the the trusty, the old trusty Quarryman, which is essentially a laser profile for benches. So it's essentially a, a laser scanner that profiles the bench and creates a surface. And for open pit or for blasting, we we use that uh, that scanner to produce the uh, the data set for the front of the bench, which then can be used in conjunction with the board track to produce. Uh, overburden dimensions, and then from there, proper calculation of explosive loading and and just assessment of fly rock, etc. So the quarryman, and then the board track, which we'll talk about it today. It's uh, their deviation sensors, so they're probes that go inside of the holes to map out uh, deviation movement of the drilling of the hole. Again, producing accurate position of what the hole is doing underground inside of the, the rock itself and and assisting with all the uh, all the rock mechanics and and blasting decisions further from there um, so yeah so the main focus from LMD is uh, as described here mining blasting uh, nuclear applications and obviously construction the construction industry uh, and then I'll just uh, I'll just mention uh, just so you know we're obviously we're an American company with uh, offices in York, United Kingdom. As I mentioned, it's uh, York, the United Kingdom is where the main factory, the main development of these products are based from. And then we have uh, additional service and support offices in, um, in Maysville, Kentucky, United States. We have also an office for, in Ottawa, Canada, and then uh, Melbourne, Australia. So that's our, that's our footprint. Um, okay, so uh, diving right into the board track, so um, you can see there on the image, and you can actually see it up here above me, the sensor itself. So the board track 2, as we're calling it, it's actually, it's the evolution of the uh, board track or the rotted board track. Some of you might have remembered uh, the board track with rods. We moved away from the rods, and now we use an internal MEMS sensor, uh, and the MEMS sensor essentially calculates all the movements, including rotation, pitch and angle, sideways motion, and essentially allows us to know where the board track, what the board track is doing at all times in real time inside of the hole. So because of that, because of that uh, ability to calculate rotation, we no longer need to have rods or fixed apparatus to maintain a directional movement on the board track. So that's been the, the greatest, let's say, 
evolution for the Vortrack is the ability to use this smaller INS system, uh, what we call the gyro. So as we, uh, as we position the, the Vortrack through the hole, we're obviously mapping out the deviations of the borehole, uh, reducing any kind of rotation, giving a straight line profile of what the boreholes are doing. Um, yeah, so the the, the system, the system it itself, it's got a, it's about 70, uh, or it's about 700 millimeters in length, okay, uh, with about 40 millimeters in diameter, so it fits through most of the production holes. Um, I think uh, you only go below 40 mils in diameters when you're doing more prospecting, um, but it fits in a really wide range of production, which is which is great. It's a it's a great versatile tool. Uh, it's not very heavy. Uh, it's only three kilos, which it's really helpful when you when you want to push it up holes, especially or horizontal holes. And the board track comes in two models. Today we'll be talking more of the advanced model. The advanced model has uh, essentially the full the full range of uh, of angles in terms of measurement. And uh, and the basic model is uh, is limited and more dedicated to blasting. Yep, there it goes. I guess that's... I should have waited for the slide there, Gustav. Okay, so the models, as I, as I was saying, so yeah, so it's, there you go. Essentially, that's probably good there, Gustav. So essentially what we've done is we've... Um, and I don't know if we have uh, anyone here uh, in the attendance that dedicates only to blasting, but essentially the reason why we went with two models, uh, in open pit quarries, for example, um, it's very, very rare where in an open or in a quarry scenario where you would need to go above 60 degrees because most of the holes are going to be downhole. So we've developed a sensor that is limited to 60 degrees and therefore more suited for downhole, downhole only operations. So again, everything else comes fitted with it. Uh, it comes with a steel rope, as you can see there in the image. Uh, it's an actual 50-meter uh, uh, steel rope marked at every meter with a uh, with a uh, an actual meter mark so you can easily read the the deployments looking at the cable uh, the data itself uh, is produced directly in the software that comes with the controller so it comes with its with its own controller its own software and it's the software is very graphic very easy to use and it has great interoperability with other packages and, of course, the most basic uh, file formats as well, like CSV or text files. So it, it, can really, it can really broaden the range of where this data is coming from. Uh, on the control itself, I should mention, you also have the ability to do 2D and 3D so you can see the full, the full range of, uh, of the project. We'll see that, we'll see that later on uh, once we uh, rotate to the actual software. I actually plan to... I'm planning to show you the, the actual software. Um, okay, so moving the slide here to the Vortrack 2 Gyro, the 360. So that's what we call the 360, or we call it the advanced uh, module. So this is ideal for any operation that's, gonna, that's going to be working underground or uh, tunneling in horizontal or drifts. So you want to have the full range of, 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 of the sensor because you might, you might want to tackle holes that are going up hole horizontal or downhole, so you need a full 360. So in that case, the advance is your, is your tool. We activate the full range of angles. Um, in the in uphole operations, uh, you'll have, uh, you're, gonna need, you're gonna need to insert the, bo the, the board track, obviously, in, in the holes in the roof. So because of that, we've developed a deployment system. And in this case, you're seeing the image, it's a semi-rigid semi cable. And it comes in different flavors. Um, it comes with the, we have one version of it that's a smaller semi-rigid cable with nine millimeters, uh, and I think it goes to 20 meters in length. So it's a smaller, smaller kind of drum. So if you're doing, you know, shorter holes, uh, mainly horizontal, you don't you don't really need a beefed up semi semi-rigid cable to handle the weight. Uh, if you're going a little bit longer in distance. Um, uphole, then we can uh, we can scale that up to a larger semi-rigid cable that has 14 mils in diameter up to about 60 meters in length. And uh, that's going to help with the operations of actually pushing the Vortrack inside of the hole 
and letting it travel up the hole. Again, it's the same, it's the same kind of controller, the same kind of software. Uh, you load your data from the processing software, whatever that might be, uh, handling different formats, DXF, DWG, uh, MDL files, CSV, text file, um, and you bring that in if you want to as your design element in the control itself, in the field, uh, which I think it's a great idea, and I think that's how you should be running it, because then in the field you have the data set that you are trying to survey the Asbel to, and it just helps out with mistakes in the field. So I always recommend to preload design if you have it. Uh, sometimes you don't have the design and you have to just uh, go for the survey without, without that background. Okay, so here's a uh, here's a a quick view of uh, of the software. So in this case, you can see you have uh, on the left side you have a uh, a three D view. I believe that's what I'm seeing here. Yeah, I think it's a three D view on the left side, where you can actually rotate the scene. You can um, you can see where the where the holes are laid out, and as you survey, the you can see the rods there. They start plotting the uh, the travel of the board track inside of the holes. On the right side, you just got a plain view, so you're looking from top to down. Uh, again, the same layout of the holes. And then on the right side there of the screen, uh, you see the project itself. So that's the, the, the tree structure of the project, the doc, doc dialog, where all the project is loaded. Um, yeah, Gustav, can you, can you forward or press the next slide, please? Okay, so the app. Um, app is very interesting. So we've we've um, we really focused, obviously, <laughs> having a software background. Uh, we wanted to give we wanted to give you an evolution of these sensors with powerful software. So what we've done is we've uh, we've actually provided you with two uh, two platform options. So you can go with a Windows 10 field computer. Uh, this is interesting because this the Something to keep in mind, the same software that controls the board track is essentially the same software that controls the, the, the cowls and the void scanner. So for that reason, we wanted to have two platforms, one in the Windows uh, format, which is going to give you in the field, uh, in certain cases, especially with our rugged computers, it's going to give you more processing power. So that was an interesting option for us to provide. And then in certain cases, just the, the light weight or the flexibility of Android. So we actually provide the software for the board track in two flavors, let's say, uh, Windows 10 and uh, Android. Um, again, the software is, uh, I think, from the, I don't, in fact, it's not I think, I know, it's one of the easiest or the easiest software to operate in terms of, uh, in terms of systems like this, both scanners and, and uh, probe and deviation sensors. So uh, it reduces the training by a factor of, of, of a lot and it's, it really helps in the field. Um, and again, as we mentioned, you can bring in your patterns, you can bring in your, your drilling data, your different strata layers. You really don't have any limitation and we'll see, we'll see some of the projects here and uh, some of our customers using this, they can load full mine sites in the field, which is, it's a of. You've never been able, it's, it's never been it's never been an option to load the full mine site and know exactly where you are operating straight in a Android or Windows tablet in the field. So that's very it's very handy to have that that ability. Okay, so some of the operations here for uh, to get started with the software. I should mention that again, the software adding to that flexibility. You can install the software in what we call a touch mode. Touch mode is ideal for the tablets. When you go to the field, you just have big buttons, and it's very easy to navigate, and you go straight to the point. You open a project, you connect to the board track, you start surveying. Uh, that same software, you can come to the office, and you can install it on your desktop, and then you run it in desktop mode. So that's if you want to, for example, before you go underground, uh, you, you want to go ahead and just load the project, set everything up so that you don't have to waste time down there. Uh, you can install the same software free of charge. You can install it in the desktop mode in your computer, and you can prepare the data. So that's very, it's very versatile. Again, 
the way I always recommend, and this is something that we, we normally need to train or, or take a look at, is, you know, I always recommend to export the coordinates straight from your design software, whatever that might be, export the coordinates uh, to the uh, Carlson Vortrack software. And then once you have that those coordinates, then the geometry of the holes will be calculated, as you can see there in that, in that image on the right side. So then you don't have to uh, you don't have to be typing in the inclinations or the dumps as you call them. You don't have to be typing in the azimuths of the holes or the coordinates. You just bring all that information uh, straight to uh, through the to the field to the controller. Okay, so in this slide here, we're taking a quick look on uh, some of the data that, we, that you're going to be putting out. So obviously, the, the aim is to measure out the holes, calculate the distances, but also understand what kind of deviations and are off you are from the design. And we're going to give you a, uh, a full report with all the details that, uh, that you want to measure out. So in the field, we'll give you a quick report of, uh, of obviously the azimuths, the inclination, the depths of these holes, so you can compare that from a top view, uh, which is kind of behind one of those slides, so you can actually see a bow's eye and kind of see how the hole is, is, tra is traversing uh, in terms of azimuth. Uh, you can see that front view and just see how that squares up to the, 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 the hole itself, the, the drilling of the hole, and then the side views just shows the deviation, so how far off are you from design. So all these deliverables can be output in PDF or, of course, in different file formats. Um, again, you can output that through the Carlson ecosystem, the Carlson Ops, or the Blast Ops. And if you're doing uh, any kind of uh, any kind of volume calculation or analysis for blasting, you can uh, you can you can extend that uh, those calculations through those softwares. Or if you passing this on to other uh, industry packages, we obviously support the different different formats and, and handshake with all these different packages out there. So the XF, last files, ASCIIs, etc. Okay, so here's another view. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a full view of the of the desk, desktop mode. So you can see the desktop mode will organize the uh, the the ribbons on top. So you see all the little ribbons, smaller icons, but they're all on top, so they're easy to navigate. And again, you can come in here and, you know, a posteriori, so after the survey, you can start cutting out your reports and getting, it, getting your measurements uh, from the, uh, the Carlson Vortrack software. Uh, perfect example there. So this is a cleaner view of the, uh, of the report itself. So you see this is a, this, this is a standard template that we put from the, from the Carlson Vortrack. Again, that, uh, that circle bow's eye. Um, it gives you the 360 azimuth of where the hole is navigating. So where's the where's the heading of the hole, uh, and then you have the uh, the fronts and the side views for the for the drilling. And of course, uh, again, if you preloaded if you preloaded the design aspects of this hole, then the reports will output the deviations and uh, and the, the errors, the cumulative errors of the drilling uh, of the of the hole itself compared compared to design in this case. <clears throat> okay, so again, a, a, a zoomed in image here of some of the deployment methods. So uh, on the left side there, you can see the, the steel rope. It comes with every single bore track. Uh, so it's part of the, what we call the ready to measure uh, accessories. Uh, steel rope is uh, 50 meters. It comes marked at every meter uh, with a, an actual meter mark that you can read, which is very handy. Uh, then on the on the upper image there, you got a the board track fitted with centralizers. Again, these are optional components that you can buy. The centralizers are very they can be very handy, especially when you when you're looking for very tight precisions on up hole measurements. And this is this is something that happens quite quite a bit because what happens, especially if you have a larger diameter of hole, uh, it can happen where the board track inside of the hole could pitch into different directions. And that might add, you know, a larger dimension to the mapping. Again, remember, the board track measures as a passive sensor. It measures by leaning on the walls of the, of the hole. So if the hole itself is wide enough where it allows the board track to essentially zigzag from one wall to the other, uh, you might end up with an enlarged dimension for the hole. 
So in those cases, we suggest and recommend the use of a centralizer where it kind of keeps that Vortrex stable inside of the uphole, and that way you're going to get a, a higher precision measurement, uh, which obviously will uh, will uh, will increase your decision your decision ability in terms of, uh, of what your blasting and your production decisions are. So uh, I'm a big fan of the of the centralizers. So again, this is the traditional method uh, for upholes. I'll uh, I'll raise my hand and admit that I. I am not a fan of this of this system, uh, but it is reliable because it's again very sturdy, but um, it's a little bit heavy for my taste. Nevertheless, it exists and it's very handy because it's uh, it's going to work. It's never going to fail. Now uh, you can see here there's a couple couple metrics here, a couple parameters for the for the for the rods. Uh, you're looking at about uh, 400 grams per rod, and um, you know so it's uh, if you go up to uh, if you go up to 36 segments, uh, looks like the math here is uh, about 15 kilos at 36. So um, again, it's one of the one of the methods to deploy. This is the semi-rigid cable. As uh, as I mentioned, there is a little lighter. It's a little easier to 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 maneuver, uh, especially on the ground, because everything is concentrated in that center in that center reel. There, it's got those ni that nice frame and the wheels. And it's slightly lighter, so you're looking at about 300 grams per meter. Um, so there's some gains there, without a doubt. And uh, it's a system that it's this system will it's a little bit more flexible, uh, and um, and it's basically what I would recommend at the moment. Now this right here in this image, it's got the 14 mil as mentioned. It's the first 14 mil uh, gauge on the uh, on the semi rigid. So it's a little bit beefed up, and it's not going to coil up as you're trying to fold it up the up the hole. So um, this uh, this configuration now it's starting to perform very well for us. And in uh, in future models, we're going to be adding a uh, counter automatic counter to it, which will will further increase the performance of the, the overall system because with a counter you can actually get the readings as you deploy. Um, at the moment, you still have to to make those stops. Um, Servicing and updates again. We we've mentioned early on. We uh, you know we got the, the main factory, the main service center here in uh, in the UK. Uh, we got uh, uh, service centers in the US and Canada, and uh, we're very very proud to please and very pleased to announce that uh, South Africa will be coming up uh, online uh, very soon, which will uh, obviously will will help the Africa operation region uh, uh, greatly. So that's uh, we're looking forward for that, but. Um, most of the software, obviously, all the softwares are, are free of charge, and um, we're always trying to maintain. We, I would say, ninety percent of the times we maintain an LT uh, service and rental uh, pool of systems. So, if your system is coming in for calibration, you need a, a replacement, a, a rental replacement. Uh, odds are, you're gonna, we're gonna have some stock either in Africa, you know, in South Africa, or in some of the other locations. So that's. Um, Again, just make sure that you, you have tools to continue the, the measurements and the production there. This is a great statement here. So, yes, uh, software updates are con continuous. We're, we're constantly putting software updates up there, and uh, these are all free of charge to, to our customers. And we, we always strive on, on customer feedback to improve everything that we do, the software, the hardware. Uh, and, of course, we, we always rely on our you know, trusted partners, uh, in this case, for Africa, Optron. So uh, that's something that you, you also can count on. So here's a, here's, a nice, here's a nice picture of the, uh, the board track in action. Uh, in this case, this is a smaller semi-rigid cable here. This is a, the, the shorter one, I think the 20 meter. And it's got the 9 mil, uh, 9 mil gauge on it, so it's a little lighter. And, uh, yeah, uh, Gustav. I don't know if, if this is a good time for me to show the actual software just briefly. Uh, just yeah, to please, you know. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, let me. Okay, let me see if I can get this happening here. So let me share my screen. Gustav, you let me know if you see. Are we seeing the screen? Yes, I can see it there, you know. Okay, so again. Uh, this is the software itself, and you can see here on the right side, uh, 
there's a blinking green light. That means we're green with the board track. We're connected. But uh, very briefly, here's what I would like to show you. And this is something that it's a trick that I teach everybody when I'm out there training, training guys, and also training with Optron. Uh, once you've, uh, if you if you have the ability to get the geometry of your boreholes, uh, in fact, I would say make that a requirement for your workflow. Get the top and get the bottom coordinates because that's going to help you greatly in the field. So here's something that I like to, to show. So I'm going to open up this CSV file. This is a uh, this data set here, Gustav, actually came from uh, Surepack. So uh, we've actually learned, and I show the guys how to export top coordinates, bottom coordinates. And it's really handy because you bring in those coordinates. So you can see here I have a small tag that tells me top B hole. And then if I scroll to the right, uh, I can actually come up here to the field, and I'm going to change that to my bottom easting, confirm that. It's very important to tell the software we want to do it. Uh, bottom northing, and then confirm. And then my last one there, confirm. So now you import that. And I just got to navigate away from this uh, early hole here. So I'm just going to click on it and zoom to it. And sure enough, here they are. And you can see that now what, what the software has done, it's actually created the design for me. So I'm in business. So if I come to... This, uh, I can come to the control, I can change my hole. Let me go to hole number three. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed that it was kind of fast, but now in hole number three, I've moved my board track to hole number three. And you can see now it exists there in, in hole number three. I can also kind of move in the 3D section here, in the 3D viewer. And hole number three is there. And I'm just going to release it here from my stand. And you can just to kind of have a little movement and now let's say that we were dropping it down now you see this uh, this real-time action and movement is because of the INS the gyro is picking any, any any movement obviously at all times now of course it's not it's not changing in the coordinate origin because obviously it's not meant to do that this this would be inside of a hole and that would never happen but uh, this is to give you a sense of what this sensor is doing we're constantly measuring all the movements now the big question is okay great uh, you are right next to the board track, how does it measure when it goes inside of the hole? Uh, what it's doing is every single flash of that green light, it's a measurement. So it's constantly measuring. This thing has, it does never, never stops measuring. The difference is I'm going to tell it what measurement I want to store. And I do that by clicking on this thing. Taking first reading. Okay, so this is the software, software talking with me. And now I've told it, okay, you've made a measurement. And I'm going to take another Taking one. Taking reading two at four meters. And then another Taking one. Taking reading three at six meters. Now this is assuming at this point, obviously this this is a simulation. Um, we're in simulation mode here. Uh, the the board track is not traveling inside of the hole, so I've never lost my Bluetooth communication. Uh, when it comes back to the surface, the board track will reestablish the Bluetooth communication automatically, and then the data is automatically plotted on a screen. Okay, so that's how we, this is how, that's how we can actually uh, do the survey in real time and then deliver in real time for each all uh, the data that we just surveyed. So on the spot, you can make a decision and, and see the data, or uh, you can see that maybe you've missed a hole. So you go ahead and survey that hole before you come up to the surface, and that's just, uh, that's just very handy. Uh, a couple other things that I guess I can mention that... Uh, could be helpful just for an insight. Uh, you can see that uh, you know as we calibrate the system, uh, what you can do is you can actually tell the system where north is. And in the field, you can use the calibration jig, which is a tool that we provide with a with the system. Uh, or in some cases, if you have the ability to align the board track in between holes, you can actually calibrate from end to uh, existing holes and that's very handy as well in the field so it's a very very simple system to use and um, again it's it requires very little training which is always helpful because uh, you know you want to get these sensors out there in production and you want to get them you get you want to get them to work immediately so the fact that it's not a complicated system to learn it's very handy I just wanted to show something Gustav really quick before I hand it over to you so again we're sh we're seeing a desktop version of the software uh, let me 
let me exit out of here. I don't need to save this. And then let me open it up. And let me move into touch. And I just wanted to quickly show this is the version, or this is the touch version. And you, and you saw I just switched from desktop to touch on a fly. Um, so again, here, you would open up your your same project. I'm just going to go ahead and just do it this way just for, for repetition. And the Bluetooth comes on. It it looks for the um, it looks for the board track. At this point, because it's a new project, it does not know what, what it's it what it is. So it's not calibrated. And because it's not calibrated, notice that I'm flashing red. I'm not operational. I'm not ready to go yet. So what I do is I keep the system nice and easy, uh, level, no vibrations. And I'm going to tell the gyro where it's at. I'm going to say I'm going to tell it essentially where the north is. Now, guys, here's where you can actually say you are pointing from hole one to hole B, for example. Uh, or use a relative azimuth, or if you are returning to the same place of a previous calibration, you just reload the calibration, okay? Or you can just tell it any direction that you want. So these methods here, they'll, uh, they'll suffice every, every opportunity or every need in the field. Uh, if these don't cover a specific need that you have in the field, then let us know and we'll add it. It's that simple. So just wanted to mention that, Gustav, so that we, we see both both formats here. The desktop mode, again, easy or handy to prepare the data, and then the desktop or the touch, which is, let's say, the interface that you would use in the field on the tablets. Okay, so let me stop sharing here, and I'll pass it to you, Gustav. Let me just uh, perfect exit, and I don't know if I, I think I'm not, I think I've stopped sharing my screen, so yep, you should all be good. back. All good. Thank you, Nuno. Yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, that was great. Thank you so much for that. Guys, that basically then brings us to the next part of the presentation, um, which is now moving over to the CALS. Um, so for the guys who are not familiar to the CALS, so the CALS is basically a, um, a deployable LiDAR-based laser scanner okay, with a optional um, a gyro, as typically with what you've seen with the board track 2, it's got the same technology built in there. So ultimately, your whole um, inclinations will be measured by using, making use of the, of the gyro inside of the, of the, of the uh, CAL system. It's currently the slimmest diameter system in the world of only 15, uh, 50 millimeters, so it's perfect to get into those inaccessible areas. And then the primary um, use of the of the CALS is to get into those difficult areas that you cannot get access to, and actually map out, um, you know, the, the 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 basically your your stopes or whatever the the uh, area of concern is, is that you can go in and you can map it out and also have visuals. So it's got a built-in camera in the front of the CALS, so you can actually see what's happening inside of 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 your stope. And, and when you're actually entering the stope, and um, but yeah, that's that's ultimately the, the the primary use of the Cal system. So typically, what you guys can see there on the right hand side, um, as Nuno mentioned, there's a primary jig. So that that's where the Cal's is basically now um, being calibrated to get ready to be deployed. So it's re uh, now resting on that calibration jig. So this is now where the surveyor will basically measure the collar position. Um, and also the back end of that calibration jig to get the azimuth towards the hole, right? That can be fed um, in, into the software, you know, uh, before or after the deployment. There's your control bo box, um, but I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit later through the presentation. Guys, this is just some of the main industries and typical applications where the the, the, the CAL system are being used, especially for, you know, in the mining space, you know, especially for blind stopes, um, exploration purposes, um, sinkhole investigations. So there's a couple of applications that, has, that, that, that are listed here, but uh, the primary one being in the mining space. So this is typically how the gyro system would, would, would comprise of. You'll have your CALS probe that you guys can see here. It will then have a control box, okay? The control box now 
uh, establishes a, con a Wi-Fi connection between the actual control box. It's got a, um, well, it's, 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 it's basically now where you will connect the, 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 your, your, your tablet with the CAL system by connecting via Wi-Fi to the control box. The cable is being plugged into the, the control box and the other side of the cable is connected to the CALs. And as you guys can see there, that tablet running the calls and scan software that you know also showed. So that's typically what you'll be using to actually have visuals on your data. This is the how the package packaging would look like. Your probes will go into this um, almost like a gun carry case, and then also the rest of the of the components will be in the the, bo the box that you can guys can see there at the back. So that's typically how this whole system would look like. Right, so the big question is why I use the CALS? So the CALS is ultimately to get into those areas. So what you guys can see in the video is actually now how, what you can see on your tablet or on your, on your, on your, um, on your, on your uh, tablet or whatever the case might be that you guys are, what, what's being used on the surface. But you will be able to have visuals on the scan. When you're scanning, you'll be able to see your 3D point cloud. So ultimately, you can explore those areas um, map it out and actually have all that data available in, in, in the real time. So ultimately the big summary is real-time exploration, real-time investigation and real-time validation while you are on site. Okay, so once again, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, so you can regular, regularly monitor your, your areas for production you can also, while you in the field, you can scan exist, uh, against existing site models. Once you've done the scan, you can already mesh your data up using calls and scan. Um, and you can already know what the, what the size is, what the shape is, and also what is the volume of that, of that cavity or that stope that's underground. And if you connect it to a Wi-Fi system, if there's a Wi-Fi network available on the mine site, you'll be able to already export that data through to the to the planning office um, for those guys to basically now do another um, other kinds of analysis or update the the mining models. Okay, just to touch on the specifications of the of the Cal system, as I've mentioned, you guys um, one can perform a full 360 degree scan. Um, what you guys can see there, it's got a pivotal uh, horizontal and vertical scan. So uh, you basically decide, you know, what's the density, what the density should, should be of your scans. Um, so it will do a horizontal round and it will do a vertical round to ultimately get you that 360 degrees um, cavity model. So it's got a gyro, as I've mentioned, the gyro is now being used to basically calculate that position of where it's that, that 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 scanning station inside of the stope. So you use those intervals as Nuno have shown. You basically make use of the board track technology of you know the the, the, the gyro to ultimately calculate the, the the trajectory of your of your drill hole to finally calculate that scanning station position of 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 um, of in, when you're inside of the stope. And then once you got that, then ultimately you'll perform your scan. So ultimately you'll be able to sit with a geo-referenced point cloud data set of your stope. The maximum laser range, you're looking at 150 meters. Um, it's got an IP67 rating, so it's really kind of built for, you know, harsh environments. And then um, the operating temperatures, which is quite important, is you're looking at about minus 10 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees. So I'm just going to go over to this image here. So there you can typically see there's your two laser lenses. You've got a transmit and you've got a receive laser lens. You've got your accelerometers and your gyro uh, that's built into the CAL system. In front of the nose cone, you'll have your, that's where your camera sits. So once you enter those, the, your drill holes, you'll be able to then see, um, let's say for instance, the, the hole is basically, um, uh, it's clogged up, you can't actually get into that stope, it happened to myself a, a couple of times, what, what's nice about that camera, you can actually now see, listen, okay, the, the hole is basically blocked, the guys can flush it and then you can attempt to scan that stope again. 
but that's just basically to touch on 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 some of the of the um, of, of 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 the specifications. So we've got um, a couple of deployment methods. So uh, the cable being the minimum because that establishes basically the connection between your um, your control box and your and the, or rather your your tablet, your control software, and your um, and your and your CAL system. So the cable being the absolute minimum, you can if it's a downhill deployment, you can only use the cable as well. It's a quite nice and rugged cable. Um, you've got uh, if it's an uphill deployment or a horizontal deployment, we actually need to push the CAL system in, you can make use of this rod set. So I'm basically going to work from left hand to right hand side guys. Then you've got the tripod and winch option. So if you, if it's a basically going to be a quite a deep hole, I mean the maximum depth, we're looking at about 200 meters that you can actually, you know, d d deploy and it all depends on, on, on your length of your cable now of course. Um, You've got a tripod and winch, and that will basically save on some physical um, input from 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 your 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 assistants or even yourself if you have to do this the, the the scan yourself. There's some uh, tripod and winch option, and then we've got some bespoke um, a manual deployment assist. That's basically now the that wheel option that you guys can see there on the top end, uh, top top um, of 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 the slideshow. So you can actually now see how that cable is basically feeding in. It's got a clamps that's basically locking it, you know, while it's performing its scan. And then also there's a trailer option. I'll elaborate on this a little bit more in the next slide. So we've got uh, dedicated bespoke options. So what you guys can see there, we, we've designed the manual deployment assist option. It works well. Um, we've actually been using using it as uh, uh, you know as well you know for for demonstration purposes. So that's typically a mindset that we were actually involved with. Um, so that's typically how that deployment would would look like. So what's nice about it on that cable, um, same with the board track on the cable, they've got these little uh, uh, noddies that basically now shows you your meter intervals so you can now just clamp it on and then perform your scans then what you can see is two trailer options um, so we really customize this you know according to the needs of the clients so for instance on the left hand side this is a diesel engine um, you know so ultimately and then on the right hand side is a petrol engine option so depending on what is you know from a safety perspective or what's allowed on the mine side um, you know, we can really kind of customize, customize this according to the, your, um, your, your requirements on, 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 your, on your site. So the, the trailer consists of a battery operated winch drum. So basically minimizing the use of manpower during the descent and the ascent of the, of the CALS probe. You also, um, the CALS scanning operations can be done single-handedly. The winch is equipped with a slip ring that allows the transmission of power and electrical signals from the stationary winch to the CALS during deployment. The operator has complete, uh, complete control over the CALS probe and the generator is also there basically just to charge the batteries, you know, so that you guys can ultimately, with a typical system like this, you'll be able to then maximize your productivity and do as many borals at, as what is required. Okay, then I just want to touch on some of the key features of the Carlson scan. I think a lot of the things have been covered by, by Nuno already. But ultimately, the biggest standout is that you can view your scan and your solid mesh data. You can mesh it in the field. And as most of us know, you know, the, the, your working with 3D data, it all really depends on the specifications of your computer. But Carlson has really kind of hit a sweet spot with the Carlson scan software where it it actually it, it it doesn't put strain on the on the processor of the computer so it's a simple way of just quickly calculating showing the visual of the of your of your stope area so you'll be able to see that 3d model and then um, be able to calculate a, a reliable volume so typically what you guys can see in this video is the whole mine model was actually imported into this project Okay, that what you guys, what you can see there, that's a point cloud 
of the of the surface of the of the mine so you can import that you can bring in your design model for your underground operations this is now what's happening during deployment here you can now already see how you're going into that specific stope of that you know or, or area of interest and then once the scan has been completed you'll be able to now have visuals of your stope you can mesh it up that white line is basically the trajectory to get into that stope and then next up is basically if you need to know what is that volume and the area of your void you'll be able to calculate that while you're on site so there's a lot of benefits using a typical system like that so it's a good way you'll have your whole whole underground operations that you can import and it's actually quite handy because then you can already see how everything is tying up um, of, of, from the new scans that you've uh, basically um, uh, scanned. So that's, this is just typically some of the key features. And as, uh, just to kind of add on, you've got full camera control of it. Um, you can scan to validate in real time, saving you time in the office, of course. And I think that's ultimately the bottom line. Just some of the limitations. Um, you know, of the, of the, not specifically necessarily only to the CALs, but it's actually more 3D scanning in general. So if your stope is flooded, for example, um, what is nice is that you have the, the, vid the video or the camera in front that you can actually have visual. So um, more often than not, if a stope is flooded, you'll be able to see that before you're actually going into the stope. So you'll have clear visuals on it. So the next question is what happens if you actually go into the water? So the CAL system is, it's got a high IP rating and it can withstand, you know, being um, submerged underwater. So um, it is basically, it can handle those kind of scenarios. But the limitation is, and as I've mentioned, with any 3D laser scan, it doesn't like water. So the thing is, when you start scanning, you will not be able to get uh, reliable data you know on on the water so just be aware of that but ultimately that is basically a limitation on on, on 3d scanning in general and not only um, sp specific to the to the Cal system then I'm just going to touch on some case studies that was this was actually a case study that we were part of um, the objective was to it was an old underground uh, operations um, they've then basically moved over it they started um, an open cast mine and they needed to keep and monitor the progress that they're actually making by you know the different layers that they're blasting off and how far they're actually now from the stopes to also monitor the 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 ceilings of those stopes so this is just typically showing you that's a data set that has been imported into uh, Trimble Business Center, for example. So you, you can see uh, this image here at, uh, at, the, at the bottom on, your right, uh, on the right-hand side. There you can see the point cloud of the, of the open cast mine and then the underground data from the CALs. We've all imported everything together and we can, basically, it will tell us the whole story, you know, how far are we now actually from the stope. So it's a good way, if you've got something like that, if, the, if there's a safety concern, you'll be able to then, you know, have the 3D data available. And as I've shown in the CALS and SCAN software, you'll be able to then actually have everything with you on site. Next up is, is a, a case study in Australia. So this was also the blind stope uh, from an ineffective blasting. By using the CAL system, you know, they could basically attend to this. Um, and as it was basically detected immediately using the CALs, and they could actually, um, you know, uh, put necessary measurements in place to actually attend to this problem. Next up in, is a case study in China. Um, once again, the guys didn't really have information of the underground operations and by using the CAL system um, they could actually detect and locate the unsafe and difficult areas. And that this is also giving you a good example of you know how to deploy the CAL system. And then lastly is a case study from New Zealand. So the objective here was to uh, they were not really sure if the data that they had from the underground operations, if it was actually reliable. 
and then after they've scanned the data with uh, or, or the, the, the underground operations using the CAL system, they could identify that um, the under old workings were there was a significant offset, and um, they could actually update their uh, databases accordingly. Okay, so that's ultimately brings us to the end of of the presentations. We're now going to open up to any um, questions. Um, I see now there's quite a, a lot of questions here, so I'm just going to quickly run through it. And you know, just be on standby there, please. Yeah, sure. Um, can okay. The first question, you know, I'm just going to direct it to you. Can the cable be extended to 250 meters? Um, for the cows, I mean, we can. Uh, we've uh, the the furthest we've ever been uh, with the cows is 300 meters. The, the only thing to keep in mind there is that obviously uh, we're relying on that uh, on that video feed as you're feeding the camera or the, as you're feeding the cows through the borehole. Uh, your only eyes to where the system is is that vi that video feed. And once you start traveling over 250 meters, uh, we really only see it about 270, 280. There's a lag. There's a time lag between the actual picture and when it comes up to the surface. And that can be problematic because you might not be able to react to when you've actually entered the void and you might end up with a scanner inside of the void and then that's lost. So I would say 250, I would say yes to that, but you are right at the top of the limit where I would, uh, I would feel comfortable. <laughs> uh, okay. you know, but again, we've been up to 300 meters and there's guys using it at 300 meters, but again, it's, uh, it becomes a very meticulous process once you go over 250. So yes, the, the answer is yes, you can go to 250. Just uh, need to have this kind of uh, procedure in place to keep in mind that, that the speeds of the, the video, so. Excellent. And then I see Tumi. Tumi is actually, he's um, the proud owner of a, of a new CAL system. Um, so Tumi basically mentioned here, they've done the scan today and the hole was scanned at 64 degrees Celsius. That was the uh, operating temperatures. Um, to me, yeah, I'll engage with you afterwards. I don't foresee that being a problem, Nuno, you know, although the, the, the data sheet did specify 60 degrees. Um, any comments on that? There is, there is a kill switch, uh, an automatic kill switch, once it reaches a certain temperature, and I think you're right, about, you're right at it. I think it's 60 degrees. Okay. Uh, I think if it actually goes at 65 degrees, the system itself will, will, will shut down to protect itself. Um, okay. I'm hope. I mean, I don't know. I mean, is it is it always the condition at 64 degrees? I think what we will do there. To me, I'll engage with you afterwards. But I think you, as 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 Nuno rightfully said, you basically that's kind of borderline. I think let's. I'll engage with you. Um, and thank you for sharing that information. I mean, that, that's typically, and that's a kind of a lot of questions. That you probably get a lot of questions on that, Nuno. But yeah, let's. Yeah, to me, I'll. We, we, I think I've uh, I think I, I think I've operated with you guys in the site. Uh, I think it was in a site in Zambia, and we were running it at 65 degrees uh, out of the clock from the uh, from the system itself. Uh, again, it's one of those things, but uh, you got to keep in mind that it's if you're doing that day in and day out, the system might shut down at 60, 65. I think 60, uh, 60 is the spec on the that we release on the brochure. And again, I've been at 65 with it, running it. But I, I can tell you that's that's right at the max. Okay. All right. And um, I think you know just while we're on that topic, if it if we're talking about it shutting down, what will t technically happen? Um, it just so turns off. It's it just, just a, turns off. Yeah, electronic Perfect. kill switch, just like uh, your phone, like your your for example, my iPhone. If I leave it out in the sun, uh, it actually just just shuts it down, uh, so that there's no risk of electronics running at a you know, intolerable, you know, temperature, which may lead it to burn internally. That's, that's, so it's an electronic safe shutdown, basically. Perfect. To me, yeah, um, as I've mentioned, I'll engage with you after the session. Um, let's just have a chat about that. Um, and, uh, yeah, then we'll take it from there. Guys, it's now just past four o'clock. I just, there's just one question. Just be with me. Um, the guys who need to leave, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, the last question is just from, from Tsepo. Can the station run on solar to charge the battery? I don't foresee that being a problem uh, at all, Nuno. No. If, if there may be any input that you want to give on that. The, uh, 
I think no, I mean, as long as the solar provides the the minimum voltage, the cows yes. runs the cows requires eleven volts at all time. Um, that's that's his operation. So eleven volts. So if you can provide eleven volts from solar, you should be in business. Fantastic, guys. Um, is there any other questions? I'm going to yeah open up for some last questions. <laughs> Okay, it seems like uh, I think that is about it, you know. Okay. Guys, um, then I just wanted to lastly just touch on the social media aspect. Um, so please feel free to, 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 to join or to, to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, we've got Instagram, YouTube, and also our website. As I've mentioned, uh, the recording will be available in our recordings archive or webinars archive. You basically can go on there. Um, our marketing department is actually pretty switched on, so most of the time it's already, it will be already be available by uh, as soon as tomorrow already. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's basically it. I think there's a last question that came through. Um, is the cows a board track magnetic sensitive? You know, I'm just going to basically, if you don't mind, that's the last part that I'm going to, if you just would finish up with that question, please. Yeah, no, uh, sure. Uh, it is not, it is not magnetic. Uh, it's not based on magnetics. So the, the INS is, uh, it's a MEM sense. So it will not suffer from, uh, from in a polymetallic mine, for example, uh, or just being around machinery, it will not suffer from the uh, from the mag magnetic um, so that's uh, yeah that's the beauty of the gyro itself and uh, you know we're it we that's why we give it the north it ourselves uh, by calibrating it to a known reference and then from there the gyro is free to to operate and yes it's not gonna it's not gonna suffer from magnetic and that's the same thing for the board track so both the board track and the cowls uh, <clears throat> INS based they, they will not suffer from magnetic in interference Excellent. Guys, I think that's basically a wrap. Um, first of all, Nuno, thank you so much. Well, thank you, you guys. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, looking forward to the next Colson webinar. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Have a good one. Um, to the rest of the attendees, guys, thank you so much. Um, I really uh, hope that you find this informative. If you would like to know more, please reach out to us. Um, as I've mentioned, make use of our uh, our social media platforms or um, make contact with your with your uh, sales consultant that you're normally dealing with at Optron and uh, yeah thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you guys soon in our next webinar thank you guys pleasure take care